Good morning, everyone. As everyone gets in, good morning. Good morning. I just want to welcome everyone to the February webinar, which is going to be on RCO development. My name is Tia and I am a person in long-term recovery. What that means for me is March 24th will be three years since I found it necessary to use a mind altering substance. I am also the uh, CARES 46. I am currently the CARES Training and Outreach Coordinator for the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse. Um, and my recovery has afforded me to be a part of this awesome team. So I'm very grateful for that. It has also afforded me to be able to be a better mother, sister, friend, and just all around person. Um, it's giving me a new outlook on life and I am just living my recovery right now. Um, I want to go over some housekeeping guidelines that we have. Um, those who stay for the entirety of the training will get a full credit of one and a half CEUs towards your continuing education units. Um, CEU submission link emails are sent out nearing the each of the end of each calendar year by it will be sent out by me. Uh, make sure to keep track of the month topic panelists of each training that you do, you go to in order to make the submission task easier on yourself. In this case, it would be February, RCO Development, Brian Kite, and Bianca Landata. Um, you will receive a certificate for the completion of this webinar um, from me. Uh, please keep up with all your certificates because you will need those to receive the credit for the CU trainers as well. Um, you will be muted throughout the webinar. Please raise your hand if you have a question or, you know, you can submit your question. We do have a Q a Q and a box that you'll see on your screen at the bottom of your screen. And so you can put your question in there as well, but definitely wanna make sure we're raising hands and um, putting it in the QA box because we want everybody to be heard. Um, and also please make sure to have your full name um, displayed throughout the webinar. So if you go to your picture, there should be three dots and it says rename. If you could go there and make sure you have your full name, that makes it a lot easier for us to keep up with your CEUs when we go to see who all was here. Um, and it also helps us to approve your attendance once the Zoom report is populated. Um, so I am going to introduce our awesome panelists for today's webinar. And the first is going to be Ms. Bianca Landeta. And she's been with the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse since August of 2019. Bianca has been a key contributor to the Hispanic community outreach efforts by the Georgia Council, um, working in her current position as project assistant on the RCO development team. She supports emerging ex existing RCOs to expand services to Hispanic immigrant and refugee populations around the state. And Bianca is a has a beautiful spirit and I love her smile and she's just pleasant to be around. So welcome Bianca. And our next panelist is going to be Brian Kite. He is the program manager for recovery community organization development at the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse. He is a CARES. He has also been trained in international peer support, medicated assisted treatment specialist, and as a whole health action management um, facilitator. In his role at the GCSA, Brian helped numerous communities around the state and nationally organize focused conversations around recovery, 
and plan for host and local symposiums to create recovery community organizations. Um, and I actually met Brian in the start of my recovery journey. So he was one of um, the people in the sober network around me that I met early on in my recovery. So he's seen me from beginning to now. So it's really awesome to be working with him. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our panelists. Thank you so much, Tia. I uh, truly welcome. appreciate you. And uh, it's a pleasure to also work with you now. Uh, it's been awesome to see you grow and, and now you're doing this. So um, as Tia mentioned, uh, today we're going to be talking about RCO development, specifically how we build communities of recovery through that process. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just reiterate a couple things that Tia mentioned. I see that we've got some new folks that have uh, joined on since after Tia has given a couple housekeeping things. So just going to reiterate a couple things. If you may be deaf or hard of hearing, there should be a live transcript option at the bottom. Uh, you should be able to click that uh, to see uh, subtitles or to view um, what has already been said. Um, if you are blind or sight impaired, uh, please let us know in the chat so that we can be mindful of that and guide you through the presentation as well as we possibly can. Um, so again, and uh, a couple other things, uh, Q&A, if you have a question related specifically to what we're talking about, try to use the Q&A option because we're going to be using the chat function for some of our engagement purposes. I know a lot of y'all are talking to each other and saying which CARES is the best. I, I'm, unfortunately, y'all don't know that CARES 29 is. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, break it to you, um, but, you know, <laughs> I probably just started something right then. Okay, so. But, but we're going to be using the chat to engage you some throughout this uh, because that's part of our process. That's part of how we do things is continually ask questions, and you'll hear more about that. So let's get started. Building communities of recovery through RCO development. Oh, there's Bianca. Bianca, go ahead. That's me. <laughs> so hi, everyone. Again, so... Uh... Like Tia said so wonderfully, she's so sweet. My name is Bianca Landetta and I am a person in long-term recovery. So for me, that means it's been over five years since I have felt need for substances to be an escape for me. Um, and because of my recovery, I get to work with wonderful people. I have accomplished so much more than I could have imagined. I've got my bachelor's degree. I'm halfway done with a master's degree. Um, and I just get to do so many very cool things <laughs> a lot more often. How about you, Brian? My name is Brian Kite. I am a person in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is that it's been over seven years now since I found it necessary to use any alcohol or drugs uh, to change the way that I feel. Uh, much more than that, it allows me to be um, a person that shows up today. Uh, specifically, I get to show up for my son, my eight-year-old boy, who knows when his dad says something, he's going to do it. I'm able to be a better brother, uncle, son, overall friend, and community member. Um, and now for over three years, I've been a part of the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse as the RCO Development Program Manager, where I get to lift up uh, the voice of recovery and help other communities engage in conversations so that hopefully that they can form RCOs um, like many others have done already around the state. Um, so before we do get started, we want to hear from you. So I think Tia, at this time, if you want to uh, drop in our first question, we want to know who's on here. We see <laughs> Tiffany Bradley is here. Uh, we know <laughs> many of you uh, right now, but not everyone on here is a CARES. We got a lot of CARES. I see. I know a lot of you are. Um, plenty Very of you. Good, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So go ahead and answer the question. For, uh, you may be able to answer multiple of these questions, but okay. Boom, boom. Okay. Now they're starting to file in. Okay. So there's a little bit of a mix here. Well, you might be answering multiple things, so. Uh, 
We'll give you just a couple more seconds. Hey, Unique. Hey, hey Tiffany. Hey, Anthony. Hey, shout out to Tim, my CARES 29 partner. Yeah, you should be able to see what, what's showing up if you write something in the chat. So that's what we see. <laughs> 42, yes, yes. Uh, for all you hitchhikers out there walking through the galaxy, Daniel has given us the answer to life. All right, we can end the poll now and we'll keep moving forward. Um, we want to give a shout out real quick also to a couple folks that have really been instrumental over the past few years uh, with this work. Emily Riblett, our Director of Education and Curriculum Development, uh, previously as a contracts manager and before that a B Corps um, a manager as well. And um, Emily was really a huge part of what has happened for RCO development through the Georgia Council and across the state for many years. Um, so got to give a shout out to her. Uh, we'll be talking more about a lot of the work that she did a little later on. So Jean Conroy is currently still Bianca and myself, uh, our direct supervisor. So we want to give a shout out to Jean, uh, been a part of the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse since 2013. And Jean's been uh, doing some great work and has really helped in a variety of different capacities, but one specifically being RCO development, um, really helped guide me along and, and support me and uh, really grateful to be a part of uh, the work that he has helped uh, guide us in. And so um, shout out to both of them. So just to give you guys kind of a quick rundown of what the next hour and a half is going to look like. So we're going to start out talking about what RCOs are, in case you're not familiar already, and then we're going to go into how RCOs develop. So we'll walk you through the process that we've been using across the state for a few years now. And then we're going to talk about how to engage communities and what that looks like. And then we'll finish it up by talking about the GCSA uh, B Corps programs that are currently going on. Kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. All right, and before we do get started, um, we've got. One question, um, let's see, we're gonna allow Jocko, go ahead and talk to us, buddy. Hi, Brian, well, hey, man. You, know, you know how I am, you know, I can't see anything, yeah. but um, just FYI, the chat's going crazy, so I have to turn my, uh, my screen reader off so if there's any questions that go up, poll questions, anything like that that's popping up on the screen, please let me know verbally okay. so I can turn my screen reader back on and then read it because otherwise I got to I got to keep it off because of, the chat is just interrupting everything y'all are saying for me. Sounds great. Well, you know what? Just because uh, what I've already stated, you know, I know that I appreciate wanted to give everyone the opportunity to get all the stuff out, say which cares is the best, who everyone else was while they're on here. We probably had a few folks joining in late. What we're going to do at this point um, for a couple different reasons is one, to focus on what's happening with us. Uh, we're going to, and, and to make sure that you're using a couple of the functions properly. So we're going to turn off the chat just momentarily. Uh, and okay. then when we need to use the chat, we'll be able to turn it back on. Um, and then if you need to ask a question, try to use the Q&A uh, portion if you can. And then Jocko, like yourself, if you need to raise your hand, feel free to, to pop it up. And we'll have a few moments where we'll be able to, to stop. So appreciate you um, giving us a heads up about what's happening on your end so that we can be um, more mindful of how we walk through the presentation. Uh, we'll do our best. Uh, to um, verbalize what the graphics look like for you too. And uh, any other, like you mentioned, poll questions that pop up, we'll talk through each of those options for you as well. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, man. Glad you're here. Glad to be here. All right, so let's, uh, let's move forward. Boom. Thank you, Bianca, for giving us a little 
guidance there, what we're going to be talking about today. Hopefully I can remember. Um, let's see. So, so part of part of what we're trying to do here as we build a community of recovery is create a recovery oriented system of care. And what that looks like is, you know, unique to each community, but oftentimes it's based up of, or compromised of a lot of different components, you know, religious communities, family, friends, therapy, physical wellness, a lot of the different things that help get us well, you know, uh, sometimes it's the judicial system, whether we want it to be or not, uh, treatment, sober living, uh, the different policies and legislation, public safety, education system. And sometimes if we can, we want to put that RCO right there in the middle to help bring these uh, different pieces together. A lot of times there's the pieces of the puzzle at play, but we're missing a few. We're missing those uh, things that help bridge the gaps. And that's where we think RCOs have been instrumental in stepping in to fill those gaps. Well, if there's anybody that's on the call, I know that there's a lot of people here that are very familiar with RCOs, but maybe there might be a couple that aren't. Uh, so also before we jump off, Jocko, uh, right now on the, on the screen is a graphic that has uh, a puzzle essentially. And on the outside of the puzzle pieces, on along the edges are these different components that I just mentioned. And on the inside, the puzzle pieces that connect all of them together are the RCO. So what is an RCO? An RCO is a recovery community organization, which is an independent nonprofit organization that's led and run by peers in recovery. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the term addiction recovery support center as well. Um, essentially, it's an RCO that is just funded by the state um, here in Georgia. So that is DBHDD's term um, for what is an RCO because they're run and operated or should be the same way that our RCOs are. Um, they just didn't start necessarily in a grassroots fashion. Some of them did, some of them were RCOs already uh, before they received some state funding. And then some of them uh, started a little bit different fashion. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that a little later on. So RCOs focus on a few things. Here's the puzzle pieces again from the center of the RCO that was those four pieces. Well, here they got labeled of what they provide, advocacy, community education, training, and peer support services. Now the Georgia Council is a statewide RCO. And so we provide a variety of different services. Um, and it started off as advocacy, moved into training, and has grown since to where we do provide some peer support services, um, mainly the warm line and uh, some services in the Northeast Georgia hospital system. And we'll touch on a couple of those later on as well. Now, each community, like I said, is unique. And they all have various different components that help people recover. And you know, we recover in a variety of different ways. Um, but I think that something is common to all of us. And so we want to answer a question now. Um, and so here, what we're going to do is turn the chat back on and ask you a question. Sorry, Jocko, if you get bombarded here. Uh, we're going to ask you a question. So where does recovery happen? It's not a poll question because we didn't want to put a bunch of, yeah, it happens everywhere. We didn't want to put a bunch of options. We wanted you to and kind of guide you in one place. Um, We've got a lot boom. of everywhere. Thank you, Jason. There, that was Jason <laughs> Gladys. That was what I was looking for. Everywhere in community, Vicki. It does happen everywhere, but yes, specifically, it's happening in your community. It happens in communities. And so that's where everywhere, essentially, yes, yeah, everywhere in communities. So um, that, that's what we want to talk about is how, how recovery is happening in communities. Well, how can we make sure that everyone, no matter who you are, what you look like, what race you are, what, um, uh, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, um, whatever, whatever the, the thing is that no matter who you are, that, that you are receiving services. 
um, that you're able to get the recovery that you want, whatever pathway uh, you choose, whatever way that you get introduced to it, um, whether that's through the education system, through the judicial system, through a family or friend, through your religious community, that no matter where you are, you're able to get connected and find a place to feel safe and you can recover well. And so how we've been able to do this at the Georgia Council is through really the basis of a lot of the work that we do is through the appreciative inquiry model. And um, we'll probably be able to share these slides, yes, afterwards. So appreciative inquiry essentially is an idea where we're looking for the positive. I know many of you know the question, what's right with you? Well, that's based off of this appreciative inquiry idea. Instead of looking at a deficit um, of, or a problem, you know, and trying to approach things that way, what we're going to look at is an asset-based idea or solution-focused um, idea and how we can move forward by focusing on what we do have. And so that is where the, essentially um, we use most of the work that we do. That's why that question, what's right with you, exists, is through this appreciative inquiry model. And it's helped us grow um, not everything that we do from education, advocacy, the services, and ensuring that we are inclusive of all people and all pathways. And as we've grown uh, since we started, we, we tried to ask a few different questions. Um, and there's a lot of questions that you're about to see on the next page, so don't feel overwhelmed. Um, um, Oh, you know what? I'm going to go back to this. I apologize, Jocko. So when I was mentioning about appreciative inquiry, we're looking at a graphic and it's got these two guys standing on uh, essentially this plot of dirt. And one of them's looking at this hole that's got a shovel down in it and it says deficit focused. And the other is looking at a pile of dirt that obviously probably just came out of this hole and it says asset base. One of them says, look at what we're missing. And the other one says, look at what we've got. So here there's a timeline of recovery, uh, essentially that's walking through the timeline of GCSA, super tiny. So you're not gonna be able to read, which is good because I'm gonna ask a poll question later and you probably have the answer on this graphic. Uh, but what it does show here, I want you to think about is these questions and how we were asking these questions early on to figure out how we could support the state of Georgia better. And this is prior to me even being in recovery when these questions were being asked of people around the state uh, through the Georgia Recovery Initiative that happened in accordance with DBHCD, GCSA, Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, and a couple other agencies to help figure out what the state of Georgia needed to do and where their focus needed to be. Again, what do we have? So what do you think about when you hear recovery? What does it mean to you? Could you share any stories about how you, your peers, colleagues, family members think about recovery? Number three, if you consider the supports needed to help a person's recovery journey, what resources do they need? Number four, in what way do state agencies help someone gain access to these resources? Number five, what do you think we could improve? Six, are there any concerns or barriers we should be aware of as the state moves in this direction? Seven, who or what will most successfully drive this movement? And I think many of you may agree, and I do, I think of who will most successfully drive this movement is a lot of the peers, a lot of the peers that are on this call. You know, um, uh, the state, other people or clinicians or whatever, it, it's all those pieces of the puzzle that that really do, but but we've seen things just explode over the past years as RCOs and, and CARES and the peer workforce has grown. And it's been amazing to witness and also to be a part of. So all of these questions compromise uh, what was happening as, um, as the Georgia Recovery Initiative kind of developed and then moved into 
uh, the CARES program and RCO development and how things began in the state of Georgia. So I wanted to give you a little bit of the history and some of the questions that were asked for people around the state. And again, bringing back, this was trying to decide what we had and where we could grow and what could be better so that we can move forward into what's next and the possibilities for the future. And how we've kind of looked at ourselves now is thinking of the Georgia Council, not so much as uh, the Chick-fil-A of recovery, as you see on this graphic, Chick-fil-A, but more, and we didn't think that franchises of ourselves needed to be based everywhere because like you said, recovery happens in the community and GCSA is not in every community. Uh, we're not embedded, we're only so many people and especially um, much smaller in years past. So what we thought of was that we're more like the Home Depot, and the graphic here of the Home Depot. You can do it and we can help. So our hope is that we can just come alongside you, come along each side uh, of either our recovery champion or the community and just guide them and support them in the process uh, to building up a recovery community within the place that they live. And things are not always quick. Uh, sometimes they're a little slow. Uh, we kind of think of it as like bamboo, as you see this uh, bamboo forest here on this uh, screen. Um, and bamboo, uh, you may have heard this saying before. I wasn't until Neil Campbell, our executive director, made me aware. But bamboo, they say in the first year, it sleeps. In the second year, it creeps. And in the third year, it leaps. That's kind of been our MO here at GCSA too. Things were slow at first, even especially before Neil came on. And then even the first few years afterwards, and then things were creeping along and now things have exploded. And you can see here when Neil came on in 2008, um, our uh, funding streams were pretty insignificant. Uh, at about $80,000. And as of uh, this year, not quite yet, but potentially uh, over $6 million in all of the programs that we help support and provide. And a lot of that money ends up going back into the communities that we serve as well. So um, there's a few folks on this call that are probably receiving just a, you know some portions of that money as well. So in case you're not familiar with who we are here at the Georgia Council, uh, we are a statewide RCO, like Brian mentioned already. And so for over 20 years, the Georgia Council has been a voice of recovery in Georgia. And we help to provide advocacy, training, education, and peer recovery support services, which we'll break down a little bit more as we go along. Um, we also ensure that the peer voice is heard. We like to say that nothing uh, about us without us. So we, especially Neil, like to make sure that we are getting into as many tables and conferences or conversations in general as we can. And so from one employee, which was Neil in the very beginning all by herself to now 35, uh, all of us here at the Georgia Council uh, have lived experience with recovery. And from one peer run RCO to now 38 across the state, we've definitely left and uh, continued to as more and more develop. And so like Brian said, we like to think of ourselves as the Home Depot of recovery where you can do it and we can help. And so what we do exactly, uh, since we're a diverse community of individuals in recovery, we organize and mobilize recovery communities and the peer workforce statewide. And so many of you are carers, so you're probably familiar with that. And so the way that we see it, there's three major challenges uh, to individuals and communities, and that is isolation, stigma, and extremely limited resources. And a lot of those problems were exacerbated in uh, the pandemic and because of COVID. And so we support the restoration and wellness of individuals, families, and communities. And so a big portion of what the Georgia Council uh, is built off of is the CARES program, which is our uh, certificate program. So it's a 40 hour program that you can go through to become a certified addiction recovery empowerment specialist. 
And um, we now have a workforce of almost a thousand, right, Brian? I think we just finished our last or our 47th class of CARES. And so that is a whole network that we've got across the state now. Yeah, the peer workforce is really um, well, obviously, Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, shout out to them for, for starting uh, the peer specialist program, first me Medicaid billable in the country. And then um, we kind of built off of that and dedicated a substance use disorder um, certificate as well. And so uh, we're going to ask you a question here uh, about when the CARES program started. When do you think that the CARES program started? Many of you may know. Um, I'm going to shut down the chat so you can't get the opportunity, but we had a poll here to, to ask. So when did the CARES program first start? Oh, we got a couple answering. So most of y'all know happened in 2017. Oh, well, we had one person, two, one person thought it might have. A um, few folks thought 2014 and a lot of people Oh, we got some other folks. Okay. Well, we got most of you have answered the question now. Um, and so I'll go ahead and say in 2011, the CARES program, uh, CARES One um, was, was first uh, initiated. So there's uh, only a few cares ones that I know of that are pretty active still today, you know, Dina Davis, Tony Sanchez, um, a few others. Um, shout out to Neil and George uh, brought for uh, their work and, and uh, many others that helped come and form the cares program to, to help develop and, and work on uh, where we're at today. You know, if it wasn't for them and the work that we're doing, uh, the peer workforce, uh, especially for, uh, substance use here in Georgia would not be what it is. And we wouldn't be in the positions that we are. I know I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for uh, some folks coming before and, and developing something and creating so many opportunities for many of us around the state. Um, so let's keep going here. I know Neil likes to say it often, and it's definitely a true statement that people will support world that they helped create but that originally came from dale carnegie so sorry Neil. <laughs> but um that's pretty much what we work off of especially with rcos is we want to bring the whole community together and bring as many people to be a part of developing that rco so that the whole community can feel like they're contributing to it and then they're more likely to help sustain it long term so the georgia process for RCO development um, looks like it's, well, it started in 2000 and, uh, well, the conversation started in 2013 and, and really got developed into um, implementation in 2015. And shout out to Tony Sanchez, who was the first person in my role, and then Chris Johnson, uh, who now works as Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, uh, stepped up and was in this role. And then Nick Estabrook, um, did it for a period of time. And I'd like to say, just to uh, point this out, that I am the longest running RCO development uh, uh, program manager in the, in the history of Georgia Council uh, for over three years now, oftentimes. And, you know, folks come into, you know, various roles and they step up and they move out into to other venues and, and help. Well, I will say that each of them had gone into different roles to help uh, grow. Oh, Margaret Renfro, another CARES One. Shout out. That's awesome. Okay. Sorry, Margaret. Um, but they started this process and and it's essentially looked very similar. That we've made some slight changes, uh, grown a few things, realized like, okay, what's worked well and what hasn't over the years as many RCOs were developed and grown. And um, but a lot of it was based on this symposium planning process. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But there's one thing that's always been a commonplace, no matter what the situation was and no matter what we do. And that's through these listening sessions, community listening sessions. Um, so we've engaged communities uh, to talk about a few different things, um, share with them 
address the problem that's happening specifically uh, across the nation, the state, and then with their local communities. I know many of you on this call uh, were <laughs> have been a part of them, and I saw a shout out to uh, Jason mentioned uh, the Jasons on this call. We're we're going to Lumpkin County tonight to hold a listening session uh, to talk about how we can uh, grow supports for their community and hopefully uh, grow an amazing RCO. And they're already making some awesome connections. So great stuff happening there. We really want to emphasize that it's important not for us to just come and share some information, but to hear from them uh, because we want to make sure that they know their voice matters. So uh, another thing that we like to do before we jump into the community engagement piece is, is get the folks started to ask and um, engage themselves and in getting connected. You know, what we believe the opposite of addiction is connection. Bianca, you want to talk a little bit more about how we um, get them started? Sure. Um, so it usually like you said, starts with a recovery champion and we get as many people together as we can so that we can have smaller conversations like dyads and things that um, we like to bring into the listening session. So a dyad is basically a conversation with some extra rules involved and we break it up into partners. So there's always a partner A and a partner B. And uh, partner A is given a question to answer. So for a full two minutes, they're asked to speak on, in this case, we would ask what helped you come back from something difficult. And on Zoom, it's been fun because person B just gets to listen and mute themselves, which is a little easier <laughs> virtually than in person. Um, and so that is an experience that we uh, bring to the community so we can kind of break the ice sometimes and get everybody uh, more comfortable in realizing that you can really build a connection with someone in not too long of a time. <laughs> um, two minutes isn't that long. As long as you're actively listening, you can learn a lot about someone else. So I'm just going to go ahead and mention, I, Jocko, I apologize. I'm trying to do the best I can. The slide previous to this, um, we had a couple slides. So one was just a listening session where we had a lot of folks. Jocko had a listening session out in South Cobb. Um, him and Sarah Carriar, uh, shout out to both of them for helping uh, kick something off. And, and they're still pursuing uh, uh, growing the Phoenix and uh, what they're able to do um, out there in South Cobb, Austell, and, and um, the area surrounding that area. And then the next slide had just a graphic that said, your voice matters. Um, then we had a graphic of the folks engaging in the dyads uh, together. And then now we're on the slide about the dyad, just explaining what the dyad is, what helped you come back from something difficult. So at this time, um, just like Jocko raised his virtual hand earlier, we're going to ask, since we can't break you out into breakout rooms here on a webinar, what we can do is hear from some of you. Uh, we would like to be able to hear from a couple of you what helped you come back from something difficult? So if you're willing and can do it in under two minutes, uh, we'd love to hear from a few of you. So if somebody would like to raise your virtual hand and we can uh, call on you, allow you to share what helped you come back from something difficult. Now, whether you're, you might be on this call and not even in recovery, um, and then that's okay. We've all faced challenges in life. And we're all here. We're all on this call today. So that means that you've probably come back or at least made it through that difficult situation. We've got a couple folks. So boom, boom, boom. Hey, I know all of y'all too. Uh, anyone else want to raise your hand? We'll, we'll do what we can to call on you. So I'm just going to go in the order of uh, I saw hands raised. We probably will only be able to get to these first four. So Jamie. What helped me come back from something difficult was um, I put myself in treatment. My dad passed away. Um, so I put myself in treatment, and then I joined uh, Accountability Court, Family Treatment Court in Hall County for double accountability and um, graduated both programs and have full custody of my oldest son today, and my youngest son never has to see me under the influence. 
sharing. Awesome. So accountability court uh, has really helped. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, let's see. We've got, and you know what? Just for everyone else, um, I'm going to allow, I'm going to promote y'all to a panelist and then I'm going to demote you after you've, after you've shared. If you want to, if you're comfortable and you want to share your video too. Uh, let's see if we get Claire to do that. Claire, if you want to start your video, you can do that. And if you just want to share, okay, here we go. Hey guys, um, my name's Claire and I'm from the Dublin, Georgia area, but um, something that helped me come back from a difficult time um, probation officer like having belief in me um because i came straight out of detox and uh she had in me and was like we're gonna do this together i'm through it like would stay in contact and even afterwards after our completed treatment and got out and kind of transitioned back into the community um she was there to help with that transition and uh I reached back out to her to see what I could do to go to that program that helped me get there. So um, that and like counselors. We're having a, a little difficult time hearing you Claire, but we've heard some of it of your family and, and counselors and um sorry sorry those uh they couldn't hear claire i know claire is really awesome love you claire and uh wish we could hear you a little bit better um i'm gonna put you back to the attendee but we heard some of that um your Ellen, probation. Yeah. and probation yeah I'm just gonna allow y'all to unmute since, just in case we're having some difficulties with uh, switching you over and, and sharing the video. So Ellen. Uh, good morning or afternoon. Um, I uh, came into treatment by the community because I didn't know anyone. I had never heard of treatment or service or resources. So I went to someone in my community, which was in the church. And it so happened that she had had a son that was addicted. And so I just wanted to share that it might not be someone in an agency you talk with, it could be a neighbor, but someone can direct you. So I'm so thankful for the service in the community and the agencies that are available. I have 34 years of uh, one day at a time recovery. And I have an agency that um, we support the community in many areas and that's Full Circle Outreach Center that's located in DeKalb County uh, in the city of Stone Mountain. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And we have time for a couple of days. Yeah, we need Hey family, hey Bianca, hey uh, Brian. So uh, my name is Jonna and what helped me come back from something difficult. Uh, my story kind of aligns with Jamie, which is what's beautiful about sharing um, pieces of myself and hearing others share pieces of them. I actually um, found my father passed away when I was 19 and struggled for over 20 years with the trauma that I had experienced. Through that process, I did go to treatment through accountability courts as well, which did lead me to a community of where I'm still plugged in at today. You know, recovery, I didn't know was something that was possible um, for all that time. And once I came into the accountability courts, I was introduced to some programs where, you know, I was able to 
share my experiences and find my purpose in life. And it was such a beautiful process. You know, today I'm a trustworthy person. I am a productive member of my society. Um, <clears throat> I have a little over eight years of long-term recovery. And thanks to the education, the resources, and the community in which supported me, I'm able to maintain that today. And it has been a remarkable process on this road to recovery, but um, the community and the people that I am connected with is what keeps me well today. Awesome. Thank quick, you. Real quick, shout out. Shout out yeah. to what you're doing. Tell us who you are, where you're at. Shout out to Self Discovery 24. We're trying to develop an RCO uh, up here in Stevens County. We also have a recovery symposium that is going to be planned for June the 11th. Please stay tuned. There will be more information that will be shared. And uh, all the recovery champions, allies, and people in the Northeast Georgia area um, are invited to come out and you know help us join together and show this rural area in Stevens County that recovery is possible for them as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Lauren, I don't think we're gonna have time to, to get to you, but uh, Talera, go ahead. Let's see, uh, allow you to talk. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Talera. Um, and what helped me to recover from something difficult was my, my foundation, my foundation of God. Um, I had that to draw back to over and over again throughout my years. It was planted in me deep and the, the, the most profound thing was realizing that I had spent 15 years of my life in and out of county jails. When I first started going to jail, my son, my oldest son was 15, was five. And when I realized, I looked up and realized he was 20. And I, and it wasn't until he come to see me one time, the very first time. And I realized when I first started going to jail, he was too little to even come to the jail. Now he's old enough to come visit me and leave me money. Um, and, and that hit home for me. And, um, but the biggest thing was when my, that year, that last year, which was um, November, 2018, he come and asked me, would I make dressing for Thanksgiving that year? And um, I told him, yeah. And I got locked up a week before Thanksgiving. And that just hit home for me. And I knew that that, that something had to change. And so um, 2000, uh, um, November 16, 2018 was my was my last time using any minor mood altering substances. So, um, yeah, for me, it was my foundation in God. It was realizing I had spent over 15 years of my life in my insanity and the fact that I was unable to make dressing for my son that year. It really hit home um, and it was enough. So today I'm now the director of Mother to Mother Recovery Center and I'm a Karis 43, yay. Ooh, ooh, shout out, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, you so amazing much. stuff and I can really, uh, whew, that, that is powerful to hear from your your son being there and then come in and to see a grown and then that not being able to be there for him after he had asked you to do something there. And then, but where you're at now and what you're doing is amazing. So thank you all for those that you shared. I could relate to most of you too. Um, and some of you are what you're sharing now. Um, just being able to listen and guide in the right direction. Others believe in me, listening, uh, accountability, court, faith, hope, support, sponsors, family, Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it, Bianca? It does, because we've asked a whole bunch of people, and it's funny because you know, humans just go through hard times, and we all seem to find similar things to help us get out of those hard times. And so that list of, of this same conversation that we've had with lots of other people uh, is what we've got up on the screen. So those things that help look like family, support, friends, forgiveness, faith, compassion, resiliency, 
helping others, having a meaningful career or work, uh, just time sometimes, and, and education, hope, new beginnings, and sometimes taking action. Those are the things that tend to help us go through or get through those tough times. So this is what we use at the listening session, at the beginning of the listening session. So to make sure that we can get the, the folks comfortable with one another, show that even though there might be some stakeholders there present who have been in the community for a long time, or maybe some folks that are in recovery or in a recovery program currently. But when we get these different people uh, from different walks of life, look differently from one another, to take two minutes out of their time, we create a connection. And already, a lot of times there's hugs being shared at the end of this two minutes, conversations keep going on and we got to wrangle people back to their seats. Um, I know that most of you know this experience of sitting in a dyad and, and creating a connection. And uh, you might have been in a dyad with somebody before and those two minutes sparked a, a friendship that has continued on to this day. Well, when we're able to do that, then we can create the floor to where we open up a space where people feel safe about sharing. Um, sometimes they've probably been to community events where a lot of talking was done, but then no action. Well, we wanna create a different type of environment uh, so that we can talk about a few things uh, where we're gonna ask a few questions. We're gonna ask them and engage them with some questions about what's working here within this community. Cause there's always something working. Even if we don't think that there's a lot working, there's something. <laughs> We often know that some, some things could be better. So that's what we're going to ask about, too. Um, sometimes we're going to make sure that we stay focused, though, on one thing first. So we'll keep it on what's working. And if somebody tries to move to, well, this is what could be better. We want to go, all right, let's get, let's get our solutions out there, the things that are happening first. And then we're going to talk about what could be better. So we'll answer these questions as you see these first two questions here. And then our last question is, what's next? How can we move forward? And then that's where we're going to take things next for the listening session. At the, at the listening session, this is kind of the most important piece. And then we'll move forward. We'll share a couple RCO programs. Um, we'll ask our recovery champion that brought them there together to lead us in a conversation um, moving forward so that we can stay connected as the RCO develops. They'll take the answers from these questions and use it as their catalyst, kind of their strategic plan, their priorities. Uh, to focus on as they move forward in developing the RCO. They've created these connections, hopefully at the listening session with some community stakeholders, um, perhaps the sheriff or the mayor or some county commissioners or um, other agencies that provide services, a lot of the recovery community. And now we got the key pieces, those outside puzzle pieces that you saw or heard about earlier, and that are gonna be those bridge that, okay, now we've got the pieces together. We can put the middle pieces in there as the RCO and start accomplishing these goals to make a recovery-oriented system of care within this community. Well, we're gonna engage you in a little bit right now too. Um, we're gonna hear from a few folks. This time, we're only gonna hear from two people for each question, okay? So stay with us. Bianca's gonna walk us through what these questions are. And so we're, again, just like we do in a listening session, we're gonna do one question at a time. We're not gonna see all three. Um, hopefully, if the, the slides work accordingly. Uh, so, Bianca, will you guide us through and then we'll have two people that are willing to answer this first question. Perhaps we can get somebody from, uh, there's two parts of this question because there may not be somebody that is a CARES or is working in uh, this setting. So. so, our first question is, what is working for you as a CARES peer in a professional setting or as an ally or friend supporting others in recovery? And I saw we already had one hand up to, uh, yeah, now to. So we've got David and Unique. Well, that was a quick hand. I wonder, David, David might have a question that's not about this uh, or, or wants to say or something, but uh, Mr. David, David's been doing this work for a long time too. Shout out to David for uh, some of his work and helping uh, the peer movement across the state of Georgia. Thank you, sir. Hey, thanks. I actually hit the uh, <clears throat> raise hand and lower hand by mistake, but I'm just listening. But thanks, thanks. This is really good. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. I was gonna say that was quite the quick hit. <laughs> <laughs> Unique was up next, to me. All right. Unique. Let's see. Uh, allow you to talk. Boom. There we go. All right. Hey guys. Um, hey. So what's working for me, it's really good to see all you guys. What's working for me in a professional setting is um 
allowing myself to be transparent, um, but also understanding the different views from um, the different uh, people because I sit with clinicians and you know their language and stuff can be different. Um, so I think just having some empathy and compassion for them as well um, helps me in that professional setting. Thank you. Love Thank you guys. You. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Love you too. <laughs> hey, if, just uh, before Lauren and Lita uh, share, we want everyone to, to please, please, please drop it in the chat because this is what the listening session is about. We record all of this information. We don't just ask the question. Bianca, generally, <laughs> or Emily, if she comes along, I'm not the, I'm not the quickest writer, so, uh, uh, off, but sometimes I'll write too. So we're always writing these answers down. So I want these in the chat too, because we're recording this information. This isn't just a webinar for y'all to sit on and listen. I know that y'all are thinking that, hey, I'm just going to get my CEUs and go about my day. We're hoping to get some information from you. So we want to know what's working for you as a CARES uh, or a peer in a professional setting, if you are in that capacity, or as an ally and friend. Lita, hey, Lita, glad you were able to join us. Sorry, I didn't respond to you. Hopefully, William got back to you, it seems like. Well, I'm in. That's all that matters. We're good. Thanks, <laughs> Brian. Hey, everybody. I'm Lita, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And as, um, as an ally, um, for, for the people that I serve, um, you know, I'm able to break down some stuff for them because, you know, a lot of times when we are out and about using a lot of our personal skills are, are, uh, lacked, are lacking and not maturing. And so I'm able to kind of gap that bridge for them um, and kind of break things down for them to kind of ingest it piece by piece instead of it being so overwhelmed for them um, and just, you know, being transparent and let them know that I've been there so that, you know, um, I'm not here to judge that I'm, I'm just, I'm just assisting. Thank you. Awesome. That's exactly what we're here to do as cares, right? Who else? Okay. I, I need some more responses here. All right. I've got, I've got a few here, but we need some more stuff. We want to know what's working. Non-biased environment for those that we're getting some good stuff here happening. I love it. Oh, we got a couple more folks. Uh, we're going to hear from Lauren and Jocko. Lauren? Hi, everybody. Hey. Hey, I'm on my way to work right now. And um, what has helped me in regards to the CARES training and being a CARES, I'm an HST for a forensics residential. And so I try to utilize, I do utilize impairing the individual and what is right with them, as well as I want to say that I demonstrate by example, giving a perspective that I can be in a professional setting. And I too was once in the place of the individuals I served. So I think it creates um, like, like what the face of recovery looks like and that recovery is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. When it, when someone was able to tell me like, like when I'm coming in early recovery, I could not see myself in any type of capacity aside from the types of jobs I've had, menial labor, doing whatever. But when I see them come in and then share their experience, I'm like, wow, that, that could potentially be me. Let's hear from Jocko real quick. Gloria, I don't think we'll have time for this question, but hold on because we may be able to answer another question. Jocko, go ahead, man. Um, what helps me in the treatment facility that I work in as a peer support is, you know, the ability to actively listen and to be able to accept my peers exact, you know, my phone's going off. Yeah. Yeah. Close that chat to say, well, I'm, I'm blowing you up right now. I know, but this is for the good of us. So just, just hang tight uh, for us. Uh, I'll read yeah. off a few of those responses for you too in a minute. Okay. Well, yeah, the ability to actively listen and accept my peers right where they're at, not try to change them. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's huge. Show that respect and just give them, you know, hey, it's okay to be where you're at. Awesome. Yep. Thanks, man. Um, let's see. So just for Jocko's sake, I'm just going to read a couple of these and for anyone else that may not be able to see or even keep up. I, I, I'm having trouble keeping up, which is good. 
I want you to keep dropping them in there because this is the stuff that we need, supporting returning citizens, uh, using the lived experience, um, making connections with uh, those within the community and vowing to help make my country a safer place. Um, what's working is the ability to use lived experience again. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's huge for us. And sitting where I once was and being able to support mothers uh, and meet them where they're at, Ooh, listening, um, working at Mercy Care and working with underserved and homeless population, um, able to connect and empathize, provide some assistance. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, be able to create non biased environment. Um, actively listening, 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 listening. Yes. Who will listen to what they're saying? Being compassionate to connect and relate to the peers. I love it. There's so many good answers in the chat. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So now what we got next, Bianca, go ahead and hit them. Yes, there might so be some questions. things. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So for our next question, um, as usual, so what could be better for you in whose environment as it cares or as an ally or a friend? So yeah. What, what could be better? be better? So this could be a few different things. You might have, it might be, what could be better is something within your agency. Um, unfortunately, maybe they don't see the value of peer support as much as it could be. Um, it might be within your community, some stigma in your face. I don't know exactly. Um, you may, you're probably well aware of what could be better and maybe experiences. That might be the only thing that, you know, I hope that most of you can be happy and excited about where you are as far as going to work. Um, I'm going to start with Gloria since she hasn't answered uh, a question yet and she's been raising her hand a couple of times hey hi. Gloria hi you know what could be better for me is uh, could be resources in the city of Atlanta or Fulton County period especially for women and children we have a lot of resources for the men but as someone I'm a model hope case manager so I ride the trains looking for unsheltered individuals and not having somewhere to refer them to that's what could be better for me because dealing with women and at a certain time of day there's nowhere for them to go because they got to go in at night they got to come out early in the morning you know and that's that that's what's hard for me so to having the resources available mm, yeah thank you thank you i know that that's a big uh a big issue for a lot of Let's get Jocko again. Uh, we'll get Anthony and then Dwight and uh, Danielle afterwards. Or, Jocko, did you have another question? Sorry, my, I didn't yeah. raise my my hand. Didn't get put back down. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I'll lower your hand back down, and we'll move on to Anthony. Good afternoon. One of the things that could be better for me. Um, in this professional setting is I, I get a chance to meet and advocate for the clients, but a lot of our clients that come here come from different areas of DeKalb County, Gwinnett County, Fulton County, they're all over Georgia. Some went back to Floyd County, you know, to go to different treatments. I'd like to have resources that I can plug them with so they can continue getting more peer support, you know, I, I know we got a lot of RCOs, but I'd love to know where some of them are so that I, they can continue getting the same kind of peer support that I was, you know, that I'm giving them while they're here, my coworkers as well. Um, we want them to continue getting that same support so that they don't have to come all the way back to Cab County or wherever they met their cares to continue getting that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anthony. Yeah. And just for your uh, reference, I went ahead and dropped in a list of RCOs. Allison, I see you on there. Uh, uh, we're gonna have some more conversations about Baldwin County and, and uh, Edmond we can get started talking to. All right, let's get um, Dwight and then Danielle real quick. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I am um, just in working with um, individuals in the recovery community um you know for me the question is is uh uh supporting others in recovery you know just providing the hope you know for me um um 
uh, you know, as a care, you know, because the greatest act of humanity is to inspire. So as I continue to inspire people that I work for every day to let them know that there is hope possible, they too can do what I've done. Um, I'm looking at them um, and on the sitting on the other side, the same place where I was five or six, seven years ago. And they look back at me and say, hey, wow, it's possible for me to do this. So basically what could be better is just to continue for Georgia Substance Abuse uh, Council to continue to do the work that they are doing to, um, to input people in places to uh, continue to, to, to fulfill the lives of other people that need, to need help and to need hope. Because without Georgia Council of Substance Abuse, I couldn't have been able to be a CARES and to be able to be in a position to work at, at Highland Rivers and to uh, inspire and provide hope and encouragement and, 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 and talk about and show people about the wonders of recovery. I love it, Dwight. Thank you, man. I'm going to just drop something in the chat, too, because what we're trying to do right now is really make that possible and make more opportunities. And there's some good chances for that to happen. So if you can, please take some action today by writing to your legislators. It's very simple to do. Just hit that link on there uh, uh, in the chat that I've dropped in there. And if you need the information, we'll share it to you afterwards as well. If we can get these PDFs out to you for the slides, because a few of y'all been asking, we'll share this information because there's a big thing that's happening right now. It's the parity uh, bill that's being pushed uh, for mental health parity. Uh, that includes substance use. We're a part of that. And to make sure that um, what we are as, as individuals with a substance use disorder or mental health challenge, that, that we're able to receive the support that we need, equitable support that others receive for, for any other medical uh, disease or um, affliction that somebody may be experiencing or other behavioral health uh, conditions. And we need that. We need that. And so there's a good chance that it could happen. We've got a lot of support, but there will be some opposition, especially from our insur some insurance companies. And they have money and lobbyists. And, and we need everybody writing letters, letting people know so that we can have more people, more peers. The workforce can continue to grow so that more people can get and stay well. Thank you, Dwight. Danielle. Whoops. Sorry, Dwight. Let's get Danielle up here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. How you doing? Um, so I, I love that you just brought up equity because that's kind of where I'm at. Um, there's no recovery resources, especially in our area, that are bridging the gap between the recovery community and the queer community. And, and there's a very big need for it. Um, there's just not specific spaces for this community. And and I would like to see there be more readily available for, for that population in particular. And then the second thing is, is you know, in the field I work in, the majority of the clients I work with are on um, medicated assisted treatment. <clears throat> and one of the most disheartening things is for me is when they come in to their counseling appointments and the first thing out of their mouth is that they can't find a sponsor or somebody was sponsoring them, but told them that they couldn't keep sponsoring them unless they started a taper. And I don't feel like there's like specific spaces outside of clinics for these individuals either. So what I would really like to see, especially out here in Athens is, is an RCO, even though we have two other ones, but an RCO specifically bridging the gap between the recovery community and the queer community and also bridging that gap between a lot of the recovery community and, and, and the MAT community. Um, but that's all I got. Um, thank you, Danielle. I've got, uh, it's on my mind and we're about to, I know that I just received an email last night at a perfect timing to put it out there to the world so that we can get a lot of other people a part of the conversation as we move forward and have a talk about this further because uh, I see it much broader than just uh, one area. This could be another um, statewide initiative, just like our harm reduction efforts, um, uh, medication-assisted recovery, LGBTQ+, um, all the RCOs need support in that. And just like we've had 
Riley shared about harm reduction to our RCO network here recently. Um, I see those things as well as our business connections. Um, we need better, much better business connections as far as um, funding from corporations. They spend so much money every year giving it away to foundations so that they can write off on their taxes and cover any losses that they've accumulated over the year. A lot of times they don't care where the money goes, but they just want to give it away. But we need to put out there and ask for it. So if we've got a group of constituents, a lot of people coming together and say, hey, this is where you need your money. You've got so many people that work for you that have this, um, that may have this condition or their family members, and they get stopped working because they have to focus on this or focus on their family members. Well, how about we support these programs and you can keep their jobs running, you can keep your company running smoothly, and you can help support the community at the same time. Let's do that, okay? Um, thank you, Danielle, for, for sharing. We're going to keep that conversation going really soon, I promise. All right, boom. Last question. This one's really important. And we're running out of time now. I thought we were going to have plenty of time to like go through everything. We might have to shorten some of this up, but but I knew that this is the most important stuff. This is we're doing a listening session right now. Y'all are on a webinar, but this is what this is. Surprise! <laughs> All right. So the third question that we need some feedback for is where do you see the future of peer support in Georgia? And thank you, Danielle. That was like a perfect, perfect segue. You just started lining us up. Dwight, Dwight uh, through the softball, and Danielle just like. <laughs> Boom, knocked it out there. So where do you see the future of peer support in Georgia? Perhaps LGBTQ plus or medication assisted recovery, RCO. Um, let's see, what else? Where else is the uh, future of it? Start dropping some stuff down. Daniel, Daniel, we got that conversation yes. happening next week too. So let's let's move forward there. Uh, we're gonna get to hear from Paige real quick. And I want, want y'all to start dropping it in, in the chat. Where is the future of peer support in Georgia. Go ahead, Paige. Um, I think it's going to go into more younger younger people, people under 18. I just now got a job where I'm working with younger people. And this is, I'm the first employee they've ever had that works with substance abuse. And so that's the whole reason I got the job is because they have someone that's under 18 at the facility that has the problem uh, with addiction. So I do think it's going to be moving into maybe even like prevention with the peers helping people before they reach 18. Awesome. Yes. You know what? Go ahead, Bianca. Look like you're about to say something. I was I'm just starting to say that I know we started with those compassionate conversations in schools, which is exciting. And it's good to hear that that's something we've also it's just kind of being able to share our stories to help also the prevention aspect, not just the uh, you're like, I guess, connecting recovery to prevention also. Yeah. Uh, Neil says that any, and I mean, this is not just Neil saying, but, but she often says it when she's giving presentations. Any successful movement is only successful um, when they have two things going for it, the support of allies and the youth. We need that next generation to come forward and carry this movement. Keep going, keep going. That's right. Younger generation, we need the youth as part of this. Uh, come on, I got to get a couple other people to talk for me. Y'all, y'all were boom, real quick to share about what y'all are doing and the work you're doing. And I love it. But we need some ideas for the future. Where else do you see? Yet, no ideas off the top off the table. You know, we can throw it out there in the a year from now, five years from now, perhaps. You, you got a vision for Georgia's peer support workforce, our, our workforce. Where do you see yourself in five years? Where would you love to be able to do? Uh, uh, maybe it's maybe it's connecting some other states. I don't know. Let's hear from Alvin. Gaming. Hey, guys, uh, coming to you from Birmingham, where I work in a hospital. Um, and what we do in our hospital is we go around the hospital. We're not limited to the emergency department or to the, the, the um, pediatric, the, the um, maternity units. Uh, we work with liver transplant patients. We work with people who are there for the long-term anti-intravenous um, drugs uh, infections. 
And uh, we have a consult team that tries to get them into treatment when we when they're discharged. And so it's an amazing job. And I've never heard of anything like it anywhere else. We also work on the detox unit and you know, with the IOP group here at our hospital. So I'm very fortunate and I hope that programs like that could start showing up because addiction is all over the hospital. It's not, you know, it's not just limited to to one or two places. Um, it, it's a, a great opportunity and it's just difficult to necessarily find the hospitals that are interested in doing something like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we can, um, we can attest to that. We're doing what we can here in Georgia because I would love to see the future of peer support being uh, peers in hospitals all over Georgia, not just in the few that we currently have. We're trying to make some connections and and it's, uh, it's growing. It's been a slow process though, because they don't necessarily want to pay for it, even though we're showing them, here's the numbers that can do it. Um, uh, we're, we're having to utilize funding from uh, state and federal dollars at this time, which only goes so far. Uh, let's, let's get um, Jocko, I'm gonna have Dudley go first, and then we're gonna probably close out this section with you. Dudley. Hi, my name's Dudley. Um, I guess the biggest place I see that we, I feel personally that we need to move in the areas of peer support are in the area, as was mentioned, uh, the Matmar areas, which, uh, you know, tend to be looked down a little bit from my opinion and the 12-step programs or abstinence programs, as well as moving peers into harm reduction and support of harm reduction. And yes. of course, I agree totally with with Al on uh, in the hospitals. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hear what you're saying. That's it's unfortunate, um, especially it's growing in some other areas, uh, uh, obviously, across behavioral health services. We're trying to make it more acceptable. Um, for some reason, some defect workers don't don't understand um, the data behind the medication. And we're making sure that they're aware. Um, but a lot of the supportive housing or uh, residential programs that exist are not supportive of uh, Matt or Mar. It's very limited, few and far between. Uh, there's a few great ones out there. Shout out to Arx, y'all are already on the call, um, but um, there's needs to be a lot more, a lot more education. And that starts with us. Uh, we got to get up and speak out about it. Uh, let's get Jocko, let's hear from you, home. <clears throat> Well, um, Dudley just stole one of my ideas that, you know, for sure, I definitely see in the immediate future peer support being in the harm reduction area, both, you know, in the, the clean needle stations, the clean paraphernalia stations, <clears throat> um, both with Mar and Matt as well. Um, it's that's going to be very valuable um, because those 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 um, harm reduction um, places are, are. And I mean, I see that. I definitely see that um, starting to grow and we're going to need peer support there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. One place that I would like to see it and, you know, I'm, I'm touching this, I'm starting to touch this in, in the pathway that, that I use my main pathway anyway, is people with disabilities. Um, many people who have disabilities um, turn to drugs to deal with, the change in their life. Um, and guess what, you know, not, there's not one of us on this call that is, is um, immune to, to having a disability. It can happen at any second. Um, and, you know, I remember when I was going to a vision, vision rehabilitation services place, I went to see a counselor to help, you know, help me work through losing my eyesight. But at the same time, I was going there high. And she had nothing to offer me. She, she, she couldn't help. Them. So there, I would love to see her support in this field. Um, you know, the places that we go look for assistance and, and counseling for, you know, having a disability, losing, losing something that, that we have. Um, mm -hmm. That's where I would like to see it. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Um, we had a learning collaborative for our RCOs about, increasing access to recovery support for individuals with uh, disabilities. And um, apologize for anyone that's sight impaired or, um, I mean, not um, sight, not Jago, but this hard of hearing or, or deaf um, for 
me not turning on the uh, subtitles uh, already or well, at least maybe they were for you already. I'm not sure, but I just wanted to make sure that y'all know that that is accessible. I know I shared it earlier. Thank you, Jocko. I know that's so, so important. We got to keep thinking about everyone who's not at the table or who's being overlooked. So we're really running tight on time now and we're going to have to blast through some of this stuff. Uh, thank you everyone to all your responses uh, that you've given. We're taking this information to heart. We're going to use it as we move forward to increase the recovery supports across the state of Georgia. We take it further from these listening sessions and we began this symposium planning for some communities. Um, some of them are able to take a step further uh, without this. Uh, some of them don't have as much support and really need to grow uh, because there's a lot of stigma within their communities. And in 2015, we started this process where we host, uh, plan for and host recovery symposiums. So we start the planning process and We've grown it from just being a short one month, two month period of time to going to over a four to six month period of time where we're able to create these uh, collaborative relationships, you know, having these conversations, building up this network, asking people, hey, invite some more folks when you have this planning meeting so that these folks that are a part of the planning meeting are really are what going to sustain the RCO movement moving forward. Um, it's not necessarily everybody that shows up at the event itself, it's a lot of people that. Again, we support what we help create. So then we have this great recovery symposium. Uh, Bianca, walk us real quick through some of the things that are there. So at those symposiums, you've got tables of resources usually scattered around the area. That way everyone can kind of advertise what they're doing and how they're helping the community and everyone can get introduced. Um, so there we've got our Cares Warm one. And um, they also have, uh, not sure where that one was at, but they usually have like gifts and door prizes and things like that. Um, and so just things to get the crowd and community engaged. So they usually have big ticket items like TVs, um, but most important about these symposiums are the cafe conversations. And so it's basically stations where people get grouped into answering different questions. So those questions can look like, you know, what services are existing for youth? What, uh, you know, resources are available to people reintegrating into the community. Um, just a number of different things that sort of like with the listening session that just kind of kicked off the conversation. These questions at the symposium are a little bit more in-depth to give that RCO uh, more information about what gaps are existing. And then all of the resources that are present at the symposium can start to kind of put their heads together on what they're going to do together to fill those gaps. And then afterwards, what we'll do is we'll have a community visioning a meeting. So we'll take information that we got, and you see in the backdrop there, we've got some information from their listening session or from the recovery symposium cafe conversations. And we'll use that as we develop a six month to a year strategic plan so that the RCO can use as they build up the recovery community. I'm going to quickly plow through Coweta Forest. We're not going to have time to get through all this. I know that we're not, but I really wanted to spend time and focus on those uh, questions that we asked you, because that's going to be so crucial. We're going to use a lot of this information as we go forward. Uh, Coweta Force prime example. We do this stuff. It's not always a quick, easy thing to do, uh, especially for those you got to support your family, taking the time and effort that it makes to make this happen is hard. Uh, in 2016, uh, Coweta Force, uh, Hank worked up to the opportunity and they had a symposium early in 2016, May. All they were able to do from that initially, it's not, I don't want to downplay the importance of it because consistency is the key. They had all recovery meeting for a long period of time, about a year and a half. This was what was happening every Monday night, all recovery, boom, they were able to get an extra meeting happening for people in the community. Maybe AA or NA was not a best fit for them, um, but they were able to broaden that a little bit. And it was quite some time. It wasn't until towards the latter part of 2018, where they got their first space with another nonprofit organization. And then a little bit later, they joined the B Corps process. And then in 2019, uh, they got a new building, solely theirs. And then from that, they just exploded. You know, it took a couple of years, took, took a few years. And then, boom, now people are coming from Alvin. Shout out to you over there in uh, Alabama. The COSA from Alabama came and visited them. They got bikers showing up to support them, raising funds for them making connections with the local sheriff's office. And that took a long time, about 10 months, but now they're in the jail providing services. 
um, all recovery meetings, check-ins, and the women are doing Y12 SR on their side. Um, Hank's showing up and speaking wherever he can, whether that's at the local church, the all uh, farmer's market, um, having other people show up and make way, uh, creative ways for connections, you know, come and pick up a book, stop in and visit us. Um, and now the community is giving back to them, like raising money for uh, through chili cook-offs. Uh, a couple of organizations came together and do that or dropping off checks for them financially. And so they were able to move the puzzle pieces. It's a little bit more than just throwing puzzle pieces in a, a room. It's kind of like a Rubik's cube. You really got to keep moving that thing around, uh, find the right algorithm and, and mix it up until you create that true recovery oriented system of care, that Roth that's going to make it happen. Well, like I said, um, I'm going to quickly go through uh, how it's been a little different for a couple of other organizations. I mentioned that uh, some funding came down in 2018. So uh, one of those organizations that got the money was uh, Aspire, this is a CSB down in Southwest Georgia, but they created the Change Center. Well, one thing that was still unique, even though they didn't need to go through the symposium planning process and they had the money to start an organization, they still did something. They still had a listening session. They still got feedback from the community about what the community needed to see the Change Center focus on. Reboot Jackson is another prime example. Didn't receive state funding right away, uh, but they did decide after their listening session that they were just going to drive forward uh, without um, the need for a symposium planning process. But they needed that information from the listening session to know what they were going to do. And it was only a few months after that where they were able to get some support and create the space to do that. Um, Bianca is going to share a little bit about the second B Corps program if we get time. But after the B Corps process started, we got a RCO network learning collaborative. But we knew we needed to make it bigger than that and grow all the RCOs a part of this so they could continue the conversations. A B Corps came from how, how could we expand recovery supports across the state? And we knew that mentoring process would be uh, really helpful for that. Well, George Brott, Neil, and Larissa wrote up a grant for SAMHSA. Uh, B, B Corps grant, we were able to receive it. And Emily and Jean mentioned earlier, and then Amanda Abraham came on as our data evaluator, uh, really implemented everything that those wrote to receive the grant. Uh, starts off with Wilder Collaboration Factor Survey, moves in, uh, and you'll get these slides, moves into a strategic planning process, uh, and then they cover a lot of different trainings. Well, those that were involved for the uh, B Corps process were Living Proof, I Hope, Rise, Coweta Force, uh, Reboot Jackson and Face to Face. Uh, awesome group of folks. Um, Living Proof and I Hope were those that started in B Corps uh, Cohort 1, and they mentored those next two groups. They mentored the second group and they led that final cohort. Well, I Hope's numbers grew tremendously. The first year, their interactions were only over 1,800. Uh, as of in 2020, amidst a pandemic, 36,000 interactions. It grew tremendously and the B Corps process really helped them in doing that. And they, they helped mentor Cowie to Force whose numbers grew tremendously as well. Just for example, really low numbers in 2018. I know they didn't have a whole lot going on there before they got their building in 2019. It grew tremendously as well. Number of services, 91. Number of people served over 1500 and community partners doubled in size to 20 from 10. Real quick, Bianca. So now we've got a new B Corps grant. And so that looks like moving that hospital program that we mentioned. Um, and the leaders of that right now are also Larissa and Renee Smith. And so they are working to make that a possibility and more hospitals across the state. So these core deliverables look like having recovery coaching uh, provided in Lumpkin County. So in that rural community out there uh, in their emergency department. It also involves peer support uh, being provided to moms and families. So that helps with the defects and partnerships with uh, family treatment courts, as well as trainings provided to that, uh, the staff members of defects related to recovery from substance use. And so the Georgia Council Peer Coaching Services, have, we like to push that it really does save taxpayer money. And more important than that, it saves loved ones' lives. Yeah, the numbers that have shown that they've, been able to save about $3,000 a day from NICU stays, uh, which it started off around 19, lowered it about six days. And uh, so that comes out to about, they're saving about $25 million uh, per year if you're using those numbers. But really importantly, that you reunifies families and helps heal communities 
And so we want to emphasize that. Real quick poll question before we close out, 1259, how many RCOs, I mentioned earlier, uh, that you think that there are in Georgia? Last poll question to you. We're going to get these folks to drop in. Courtney's got a question. If y'all want to stay for a couple of Q&A questions, it's, I know it's one o'clock, but y'all hit us real quick. Boom, boom, boom. All right. We got some folks that were, let's see, around 16, around 21, around 48, around 37. I'm going to give just a couple more seconds. There's seven competing almost. We'll wait till we get about 75%. Boom. I see it. All right. So we got a real mix of answers here. But right now, as it stands, we've got, here's a list of some of them. You're like, oh, okay, well, I was right. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, around 38 at some former stage of development, it's a little bit higher now because we have a couple more conversations over the past couple of weeks and, and some more to come. So hopefully we're going to get closer to that highest number. Uh, and then beyond that, I can imagine within a year or two, we'll probably be pushing 50. So guys, really just want to thank y'all for taking the time to join us in this uh, uh, discussion today. Really, really appreciate your opportunity to share with us. Uh, we've got a, a question in the chat. Uh, will there be any more chances for other RCOs to get the support that B Corps grant provides? Well, our first B Corps grant was focused really on um, uh, community development. And this time we had to focus uh, specifically because SAMHSA uh, requested that on some specific peer services. So we we could only focus on the peer services that we were currently providing. We put a dedicated focus on um, uh, the B Corps in the hospital uh, for the NICU moms. Uh, we really think how that's valuable and we're able to track the data very well on that. Um, we can track the data on the ED program, but the numbers really can be shown about how much you're saving. Uh, it's really easy to correlate that with the number, length of bed stays for uh, NICU moms with ED folks. Uh, they could come in, stay for a couple of days, they get stabilized and they go on out. Um, it's it's harder to, to show the community impact, um, but we do think it's valuable and hopefully we can get some um, more programs across the state so that we can get some people more interested in providing data because we need the numbers to show that. If you're pro providing peer support, and you're not recording data on it, if you're just doing it on a volunteer basis, I highly encourage you to track your numbers. Get some basic input from them. It can be anonymous. What we really want is to know how many number of people you're providing support to, what the support you're providing, and some basic demographics if they're willing to share it. Um, perhaps a race, a race a ethnicity, um, uh, sex, uh, age is an important one and where you're located. Uh, because if you're in a rural area, there's been a lot of money and, and emphasis on that. Uh, David, yes, we're going to try to provide these PDFs to you so that you can have access uh, to the presentation, as well as a couple links, um, like I mentioned, for taking action, as we're in a, a very important legislative session, and you need to reach out to your legislators to let them know to support uh, the Mental Health Parity Act uh, bill that's being pushed. Um, so hopefully I answered those. Does anybody else have any other questions? If you do and you don't know how to use the Q&A, you want to raise your virtual hand uh, or drop it in the chat. Uh, we'll give you just a few minutes. I know we've already reached our, our limit here, 103. You've, you've received your CEU time. You've been here for long enough. Thank you. We've had a lot of great engagement. Um, just want to say thanks again. Bianca, you have anything else you want to add to it? Oh, Bianca, put a shout out in for what you're doing too. Uh, in the chat or just in general? <laughs> yeah, just in general. So. Cool. Um, so basic, well, I definitely want to start with thanks for everyone and spending time with us and stuff. Um, but of course, I, if you guys need help with, you know, wanting to reach out to the Hispanic community, you're welcome to uh, give me an email or, or text call, kind of whatever works best for you. I'll put my email in the chat if you're still with us. Yeah, so please reach out to Bianca. Uh, she's been very instrumental in helping and uh, growing the uh, supports and our connections, at least, uh, because we're working on getting those supports. We need to make the connections before we grow the supports. And, and so we're making those inroads within the Hispanic and Latino population across the state. And we're making some headway. It's taken some time, uh, just like it often does uh, with all RCO development stuff. But 
but we're making the impact. And as we grow this peer workforce, um, and hopefully we can grow the Hispanic peer workforce as well, um, as we create um, uh, Hispanic CARES, uh, translate our CARES program I translated in Spanish. So it'll be great. We need more bilingual CARES for sure. That's, that's Yes, more bilingual. And hopefully not just CARES, but if you other speak any other languages. So bilingual does not just mean you know, English and Spanish, but we can have all sorts of different um, folks. We need we need to be diverse. We need to think about who's not at the table, who's not represented, and a lot of times um, various cultures. Um, and that's not just meaning race, ethnicity. It's like what was mentioned earlier: the LGBT community, the uh, individuals that use medication to uh, enter, support, maintain their recovery. I gotta just look for more bridges. The more bridges we find between those communities, the better we can see each other. Oops, sorry guys. I have just been notified that I still had the chat closed. So if you had anything else you needed to drop in there, please do it now. I've opened it back up. Uh, Claire, yes, I'll email you. Or actually, please email me. Um, because I've got a busy afternoon and I'll probably forget. All right. Guys, thank you so much. Karen, if you want to know or anybody else wants to know more about community listening sessions, uh, please stay up to date with our Facebook page. Uh, generally, that's where you're going to hear the most relevant information, but also our email blast. So uh, send an email out to info at gasubstanceabuse.org to join any of our email blasts as well. Thank you, guys. See ya. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I just want to remind you that be patient with me. I will have your um, certificates out within the next week or so um, to give you credit for your 1.5 CEUs. Um, if you would like to email me or Brian or Bianca or Dwayne to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, you can. And just thank you all for coming out today. And we want to thank Brian and Bianca for the great presentation. And hope to see you guys in the next training. You guys have a great day.